and welcome. This is the sixth in a series of podcasts focusing on high leverage world language assessments produced by the National Foreign Language Research Center at the University of Hawaii, Manoa. In this series, we are examining performance assessments for world language learners. In our last episode, Dr. Francis Troyan began our exploration of integrated performance assessments by sharing research related to the impact of those IPAs. In this episode, we will conclude our two-part exploration of the integrated performance assessment by taking a deep dive into the use of IPAs in practice. I am so happy to welcome today's special guest, Lisa Shepard. Lisa is currently working as an independent consultant after teaching French for 29 years in both Ohio and Missouri. She is national board certified, serves as both a Langbook and Lang Chat moderator, authors the blog Madame's Musings, and was Ohio's World Language Teacher of the Year in 2016. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So we're going to jump right into the questions. Great. From your lens as a classroom teacher who uses IPAs and who supports teachers across the country to implement them, how would you define integrated performance assessments? Well, when I'm working with teachers, I just usually have them look at look at the name, look at that, look at each letter in IPA, and I usually start with the assessment. I kind of go backwards, and just um, it's an assessment. So we're assessing to what extent the students are meeting the standards that we have for them, and then of course it's a performance. So we're not. Um, we're not really assessing what the students know, we're assessing what they can do. So they have a performance of each communicative ta task. So there's an interpretive task, an interpersonal task, a presentational task, and then our other standards, the connections and communities and culture um, in comparisons are all woven through those communicative t tasks. Thank you. Oh, and then, sorry, I almost left out the okay. I. So then the I, of course, is that those tasks are integrated um, along one um, particular theme. And I think we're going to talk a little bit more about what we mean by integrated in a couple of minutes. Perfect. So how were you assessing your language learners prior to using IPAs? Well, I think that kind of depends on what decade we're talking about. I started teaching in 1989. So back then, it's hard for new, new teachers to understand, but we were teaching without the internet. So it was pretty, pretty tough to even think about introducing authentic resources without that. I mean, sure, I had some old magazines in my room that I picked up in France, or I one, one time lugged home a telephone book, but mostly I was really dependent on publisher resources for that. So I was usually using book tests. Um, it was usually just everything was very isolated vocabulary section, isolated grammar section. And as, you know, as the years went by, we got a little bit more, um, a little bit something like an essay, but it just certainly lacked that authenticity that we include when we have an IPA. What was the defining moment that caused you to explore and then implement IPAs? Okay. For uh, for me, it was in 2015, and I know I was kind of late to the game, but in 2015, um, the state of Ohio, the Department of Education in Ohio, implemented a new teacher effectiveness system. And for the first time, we were going to be assessed on a student learning outcomes, and we were scared to death. We thought that meant that we were going to have some kind of multiple choice test that had, you know, vocab on it and grammar um, sections, verb conjugations, and all of those type things that we had historically assessed our students on. And it was so scary to think because I knew that some students did very well on that and some students didn't do very well. So fortunately for us at that time, the Ohio Foreign Language Association, as well as the Ohio Department of Education, started providing us with tons of professional development about integrated performance assessments. So really it was very new, but I just, I loved it from the beginning and started doing lots of research search and started implementing right away. I think that's really fortunate that you had this collaboration between your state's professional organization for world language teachers 
and the state's Department of Education. Yeah, um, we're, I'm really proud of the work that Ohio has done. Absolutely. And actually, I attended one of the trainings in Ohio, and I think might have been in 2015, actually, oh, uh, with wow. Kathy and um, right, and Ryan, sure. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, really well oh, done. Great. Yeah. What would you say are the characteristics of a well-designed integrated performance assessment? So I think really that um, the authenticity is really important. So I always do start with that authentic document. So having an authentic document to start out with and then having, you know, a very closely integrated interpersonal activity based on that authentic document, that authentic text, and then a presentational, hopefully, you know, it, with an authentic audience. And if that's not a po possible, at least the context is one that could happen if the appropriate audience was available. So, and then having those parts all integrated together just makes it to me more meaningful for the students. I think this would be a good point to actually explain what we mean by integrated. How do you know that the parts are integrated? So when I design one, I start with that um, authentic text and they do a, an interpretive task with that, whether it's a, a written text or a recorded text or video. And then based on the information, there's some type of interpersonal communication that the students would have with a, with a partner where they're discussing the information that's in that text. And then that's followed up by some type of presentational task where they're showing what they learned as a result of what they read or listened to and also the conversation that they had. So I want to kind of draw our listeners back to that, that sense that there is a sequence and a flow to these activities where the, in this case, if you're starting with the interpretive task, it leads right into and naturally into the interpersonal task. And it actually supports the interpersonal task. It, it becomes a resource that the students can actually refer back to as part of their interpersonal task. And then the work that, that they did in both of those tasks specifically supports their achievement of and what they do on the performance assessment portion of the integrated performance assessment. Um, can I ask, do you tend to tie those together with a context that kind of explains why the students are doing these particular tasks in this order at this particular time? Or, and can you give yeah. an example of one of those contexts? Sure, absolutely. So in a, it was an early French too, was like maybe a novice high level um, IPA was about my, um, my essential question was, how is my typical day um, informed by the culture in which I live? So that was the topic of our unit. And then the, for the, the context of the IPA was that some I, a family from Senegal was coming to stay in your home while their youngest child was being treated at the children's hospital. And they, they have a 10-year-old son, and they're going to be with you for a few weeks this summer. So you want to make sure that this family has a great time and th this young boy has a great time in your home. So first, you're going to read an article about what a child uh, in Senegal might do for fun. And then they read a text that was from the Un Jour Un Actu um, online magazine. So they read that text. And then it was, you want a few more ideas. So talk to a, talk to a friend about other things that are fun to do in the summer. Talk about what each of you do in the summertime for fun. So they had that interpersonal. And then based on those ideas they got from their partner and what they read in the text, they were to send a message to this family in St. Egal and saying, oh, these are some things that we do for fun. But with, with understanding that you want this kid to be really excited, you know, they're leaving their home, they're going to be maybe kind of nervous. So make sure to talk about things that'll be really fun for that kid that they'll be excited to learn about. So then that brings in the culture because you're, the kids are having to use what they learned from the article in their presentational task. Thank you. I think that really helps kind of pull it together. And, and I know for me as an educator using IPAs, one of the key pieces was ensuring that not only does each task flow from one to the other, but that there is a, an entire context developed around both each piece of the assessment as well as why they are all fitted together. Right. Where do IPAs fit in for you and your instruction with other assessment strategies? 
So for in my in my classroom, the IPA was a summative task. So if I had a four to six week unit, the IPA came at the very end. So but leading up to that were formative tasks. And because I always wanted my instruction to mirror my assessment, I actually planned each lesson like an IPA. So each of my lessons started with some type of authentic text and then some type of interpersonal activity that uses the vocabulary and structures from that text and then some type of presentation presentational activity after that. So so that it, it was pretty, it had that flow where really any day could have been the IPA, but they were preparing for it over and over again so that it was a piece of cake by the end, by the end of that unit. They had had those same types of conversations with more scaffolding, more limited in focus, but by the time they got to the IPA, it was a piece of cake. And that really brings back another point that our assessments should not be a trap. Um, It's not a gotcha. And they're not a one-time thing that the students are seeing for the first time the day they come to that assessment, that they've been doing what some are calling micro tasks all along the way um, that have been precisely and strategically selected in order to give students practice and opportunities to get feedback on how well they're doing on exactly the types of tasks they will ultimately be doing on the assessment for those same learning targets. Sure. And I would even in the very beginning of the unit and the packet that I would pass out to the kids, it would have a description of each of the tasks that's going to be in the IPA. It was it was never a secret what they were going to talk to their partner about. Now, I did keep it a secret who their partner would be. I like to ensure that negotiation. I made sure that they couldn't rehearse with one specific person, um, but they knew exactly what tasks they would be asked to perform. Absolutely. You kind of lay out for them ahead of time. Here's the targets. Here's the assessment. Here's the task. Or here's the path we are going to take to get, get to from where we are now to where we're going to be by the time you do this. And here's what you'll do to show me. Exactly. Um, what would you say are the characteristics of a well-designed IPA? So I think that it addresses the targeted proficiency level for the students that we're not asking an unreasonable level of proficiency. We wouldn't maybe ask them to use, um, to tell, to tell, to narrate an event in the past if they're at novice low or novice mid. Um, So, and that it's just, it's very, has that you know, that context to make it authentic for the students and make it all cohesive and make sense that it just doesn't feel like, oh, this is a test that's meaningless to me. Um, Yeah, those I think are the main things for me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, something that the students can actually see themselves doing right now with their current level of life experience if they were to have an opportunity to use the target language outside of our classrooms. Absolutely. And I also think it should be engaging. I really, when mm-hmm. I'm picking out that text, it's I'm like, oh, the kids will really love this. They'll yes. love to read this or listen to this. It should be fun. I, I had us doing one of the first presentations I ever did about IPAs was called IPA. But yeah. that was just something one of my students came up to Madame, let's just call this an IPA. And it was my first year, so it was new for the kids. And they were so used to those gotcha kind of assessments that they loved this. Oh, yeah. My students had times where they were like, wait, that that was the assessment? Right. (laughs) Exactly. Mm -hmm. And other times that I really liked were as they were leaving, I could hear them talking to each other and talking about how much they liked the assessment because they learned something while doing it. And and that was another form of engagement. In addition to it being fun and engaging in that way, they were learning from the documents, from the interpretive tasks and value that. So it didn't feel like this weird, isolated exercise that we're only doing for academic purposes. Right. Absolutely. Um, What process do you typically follow when you are faced with designing a new IPA from scratch? So I always um, do use a backward design process. So I would always start with, you know, that um, essential question for the unit. And then I would develop can-dos. I always use the actual can-dos and I just customize them to whatever our topic is. So then I start with that and then I design the IPA right away after that. So depending on that essential question and what I know, you know, what my expected proficiency level is for the students, um, I find the document that, you know, I find the the text that I'm going to use. And even though like in the IPA manual from ACFL that Frank Troyan and others uh, wrote, 
it does say to use either either a reading or a listening, and I usually like to do both on every IPA, so I want to make sure I'm assessing both of those skills. So then the, the first thing, once I'm ready to start creating that assessment, the first thing is to find the text. I always start with the text, actually even before the context. So it's kind of cheating. I tell people sometimes it's a little cheat. I find the text first, and then I develop a context. I say, Ask, you know, ask yourself, why would someone read this text in their real life? Why would they be reading this? And then that can help provide the context. And then the interpersonal and presentational can flow from that. And I know I found when I was designing them that as I was looking for texts, which when I've done presentations to teachers on this topic, um, that has proven to be one of the areas that they find the hardest because, you know, finding that perfect authentic resource and learning how to design tasks for the interpretive mode using the template um, from Actful, for example. But then I realized as I began to do it more, it wasn't enough to find one text, you know, either reading or listening, because you also needed some for the micro tasks for the practice, and then you needed some for reassessment purposes. Right. Uh, so it ended up becoming a, a need to actually find multiple texts that would allow me to really evaluate students' work with the same learning targets, but across multiple texts and give them that opportunity to practice. Right. Yeah. And I think that part's really fun. <laughs> so it never felt hard for me because I, I just thought it was really fun and have a Pinterest board for every, you know, theme that I would teach. And, and I usually ended up maybe with too many texts at the end. So, <laughs> but yeah, I think right. that's, that's a key part. Mm -hmm. um, as you explore your own use of IPAs, plus the questions you have received from other teachers, what are the easiest aspects of designing IPAs and what are some of the pitfalls to avoid? Okay. So I think once you've done a few, um, I think it's pretty easy. You know, I do follow, as you mentioned before, I follow that template. I mean, the longest part to prepare is the interpretive part, but I love that template that's in the IPA manual and I use that. And once in a while, based on the text, there might be one or two parts that aren't super relevant. So I encourage people, you know, if there's one or two sections, that, like organizational features, a lot of times to me, that doesn't tell me more about how much the students are understanding. So I might leave that part out. But in general, I use almost all of that template and once you've done it a few times it's you know it really is pretty pretty easy it just takes that practice and then um the interpersonal is usually pretty i like to leave it really open-ended because i want the students to show me everything that they know and if they can go higher i want them to have that opportunity to go higher um to show me more so i like to keep it really open-ended so that they can find their find their comfort zone reach a little bit um, and then the presentational is usually pretty good flow. So it is that interpretive part that takes the longest, but once you've do it, done it a few times, it's pretty quick. Um, I would say I think that the major pitfall that people have is if they don't use that backward design process, if they wait until they've taught a whole unit and now they're trying to find that text and somehow write an assessment that's going to cover every single thing that they taught them throughout the whole unit, every vocabulary word that happened, you know, that was found in every text that they assigned, and that's going to be impossible. So I just think as long as you write that assessment at the very beginning, and then you can um, make sure to organize each lesson ending to that point. You know, it's the destination for your trip. You know, you know your destination exactly. before you plot your map, before right. you ask for Google Maps to tell you how to get there. To get you have there. to know where there is. Exactly. <laughs> right? That's exactly um, right. So, and the thing I love about the IPA template um, from Actful, and it is available online even if you don't have the IPA manual, okay. is that um, it. I love the fact that it actually sends learners back into the document, whether it's an, you know, you can adapt the tasks for audio documents as well, whatever it is, right. it sends them back into the document multiple times for different purposes. Right. So and that's I, our goal when in reading right? for them to read and reread and reread. Yep. And it has that, you know, those literal level sections yes. at the beginning and going on to the more interpretive type of um, mm -hmm. reading skills. And those are things that are going to help them in every course that they have. Absolutely. And the kids like it too. It's interesting. I mean, mm -hmm. it's interesting. They've told me that they like it. They yeah. like thinking. Yeah. <laughs> they like thinking and they appreciate 
the way that they're being asked to interact with the document and demonstrate yeah. what they're right. interpreting out of it. Absolutely. So what advice would you give for the logistics of administering each node? So how I did it, and I know it is a little bit, differs a little bit from the manual, but because it was summative and I stayed, kept it for the end of the unit, and the first day I would usually take two days to uh, administer an IPA. When I taught on a block, I could do it all in one day, So, but um, if I use two days, so the first day we would do the interpretive pieces. Now, according to the manual, ideally you would have time to give feedback on that interpretive, um, I usually just, because we had done so many similar tasks, you know, if it's a novice and there's an infographic about daily activities or something, we had already done 10 of them. I didn't really feel like they needed the feedback before we went on. So the first day they did the interpretive parts, the reading and probably a listening also. And then on the second day, they started working on their presentational task. And I usually did presentational writings. Um, so, and even if I was going to do a presentational speaking after, I would still maybe be giving them the, a presentational writing grade on the script that they wrote. So I would give them class time to work on that presentational writing. And as the whole class was busy on that, I would call randomly call up two students at a time to my desk. And I like to assess their interpersonals live right in front me. And um, do you have any advice as we've noticed that our teachers are probably going to be continuing with some form of distance or blended learning, uh, particularly for interpersonal, because I think that's the one that that causes teachers a little bit more anxiety in terms of the actual logistical administering? Right. So I think, you know, I would love to hear more back since I didn't wasn't in the classroom during this um, time and right. kind of grateful <laughs> that I wasn't. <laughs> but I mean, I, it seems to me that some of the breakout rooms and things that people are doing, it seems to me that that's what would make the most sense. Mm -hmm. um, I really do prefer that it's student to student, and I know not everyone agrees with me that I work with, but I just, I, I find a lot more negotiation on meaning when mm -hmm. I have two kids talking to each other than when I'm just asking students, you know, questions. And, you know, that goes back to a, a feature of just the, um, the instructional design leading up to these assessments that we've given learners not only ample opportunities to practice the interpretive and presentational, which I think happens a lot, but to practice the interpersonal, including how to ask their partner in class for clarification, how to provide support in the target language with something as simple as when they see that their partner doesn't understand, saying in the target language, for example, and then giving their own answer just so that they have Absolutely. some strategies. Um, to use and those have to be built up over the course of the lesson so that when you do student to student they can draw on that as absolutely not absolutely and some students automatically pick up on that and then some need to be more directly taught that try try doing this yeah. I loved it. I had a couple of students in particular who would just, what would Madame do? And they would actually pick up on how I worked with students and stayed in the target language and they just mimicked me um, and mm -hmm. they did that with their partners and it was beautiful. Oh, it is. <laughs> I I remember bursting into tears because I had a student who was someone who really struggled. She had an IEP and she struggled with a lot of written tasks and and the first time she did that, she had a partner and she, you know, gave him choice A or B, you know, what, what sports you like the best. And he looked at her basketball or baseball. And, <laughs> oh, and I just, oh, I got chills. I'm getting chills right now thinking about it. <laughs> so. And I think going back to your suggestion about breakout rooms, I know another strategy that teachers are using in addition to those is just something as simple as having their students set up an appointment, you know, for a five minute. Cause remember novices, five minutes is already too long. Oh right? yeah. yeah, so yeah. You're going to set up just a window of this, you know, time for the two students to come into zoom to have their interpersonal yeah. assessment with you uh -huh. um, is another option. And hopefully some of our schools will be going back to blended learning and hybrid as opposed to fully distanced. And that will allow them to kind of leverage the time that they have in class in person to do right. some of those things as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, what suggestions do you have for facilitating the actual teacher evaluation part where you're actually looking at their work and listening to their work and needing to assign a score to it and also provide feedback to learners? 
sure. So I think that's kind of the scariest part for teachers is that they're looking, if you're used to giving a Scantron test or something like that, and now you're looking at this packet, if, you're, if your assessments are all in one packet and it looks like a lot. So a few things in terms of just making it manageable for teachers are um, for the interpretive part, I use the rubric that's in that IPA manual since it's set up to address each of the sections in the template. So I avoid writing anything on the student paper because I have the student, I have a stack in front of me of the student, you know, all of the student papers and then a, pa a packet of um, rubrics. So I write just on the rubric. I avoid writing on the student's paper because then I can give class feedback when everyone's taken it. I can do class feedback on that all at once, slap it up on the screen so they, they can see the correct answers. We can talk about alternate answers um, and be done. But I would not, I think it takes so much time and it's, I don't think it's a great use of teacher's time to correct the same types of errors or write in the same correct answers on 35 papers. So I think that helps with that part. With the interpersonal, I try to just give some feedback right there while they're at my desk really quickly. And again, we've done pr similar practice activities leading up to then where I'm circulating and giving feedback all the time. So there's probably nothing new I'm going to say during the assessment part that they haven't heard me say already. And for presentational, a lot of times I like to do a series of learning stations the week before we do the IPA. And a lot of times I would have them at one station, I would have them write a draft um, of what their presentational task would be. And then the next, this next station they would go to would be with me. And I would look at it with them and give them oral feedback about, well, I'm not sure what you meant here. Tell me more. What, what detail could you add here? So when I've given them all of that feedback already in class, um, I don't feel like I need to write a lot of feedback. I've, I've said what I can to help them, you know, meet the, meet the standard on that. So I think in terms of providing, um, you know, assessing in a way that doesn't take teachers weeks and weeks, those are some things, ways I've found to streamline. And then as far as giving the students feedback um, or other ways of kind of giving them feedback, I've used a lot of, sometimes it's like checklists, but I try to, um, Make sure that the feedback is is related to how they'll increase their proficiency. So, you know, feedback checklists about try adding more detail, try adding, you know, asking your partner more questions or just things that are related to what my expectations are on the rubric that I have. Another thing is I think is really important is to have the student self-assess. And when my students like hand in their IPA, um, I have them fill out, even for the interpretive part, I have them fill out where they think, I have them check the boxes of where they think they fell as they did that. And then when I do it, I circle the boxes and we can kind of see, um, it's really helpful for me to see uh, how, how close we are. It gives me a lot of insight to the student's own understanding of their own learning. Well, and for teachers who worry about students saying, well, I absolutely deserved an A. The fact of the matter is the research shows students are actually typically harder on themselves absolutely. than we would have been. Um, and I also, going back to the presentational feedback, you brought up a really good point that they've done a draft and they had an opportunity to get feedback from you. And we all know that in the best of all possible worlds, they might've had multiple drafting and refinement opportunities. And what that usually leads to is that by the time they actually submit their presentational product, it shouldn't take that long to grade. Like it should already be good. That's the hallmark of presentational. It's edited, refined. They got feedback. They refined it some more. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I want to thank you so much. This has been a blast working with you this evening. Oh, and I'm well, honored to, be to talk here. to you. <laughs> Great. Um, and you know, just everything that you brought from all of your years of experience and, and really how deeply you worked with IPAs and all the support you've provided for IPAs, I think that our listeners are going to find this really, really valuable. So thank you again. Well, I hope so. Thank you for having me. <laughs> You're welcome. And that actually wraps up our 2020 podcast series on performance assessment in world languages, but we aren't done learning. Coming up soon, we will offer a short course on TED-Ed exploring the role of performance assessment in high-quality 
project-based language learning. So keep an eye out for more news from the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii, Manoa, and be sure to get engaged with that short course when it comes out. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.